Hey, what's up everybody? It's Pykel with League of Items, and uh, today I'm going to go over um, a pretty basic way to build lineups for yourself. So for this, I'm going to be using my sheet. Uh, if you want access to the sheet and my picks, you have to join Patreon. Once you join Patreon, you get access to my Discord, and I post my sheet and my picks there every day. Uh, every day that there's games. Um, so... I'm just going to give you a basic look at the first part of my process that I, I try to do every single uh, every single day that there's games and it's you're not always going to you're not always going to be able to build the same kinds of lineups based on salary restraints but I think from a process perspective um, from a pro from a process perspective this is a pretty good way to do it so the first step for lineup building um it's really not a first step it's a first uh choice so the first choice for lineup build lineup building is um are you focused on lineup construction and ownership or are you focused on uh predicting winners There are there, the, the people in this chat are typing at each other so much. Oh my god, I gotta see what's going on in here. All right, let's see. Okay, Anyi, you boosted. Aha, op.gg. Bro, let your booster play for you. Op.gg, you're a liar. You know winning, no booster. Uh, here, dog, look at jungle diff every game you lose. Where you see 17 win rate. Sorry, I updated it's zero win rate. Still waiting now. Lol, sorry, 17 too high. 17 win rate, last 20 games in solo queue. How you play and lose so long. 1,000 games, plat 4. Uh, gold, okay. I have multiple accounts. All right, uh, I digress. Uh, so like I said, the first decision that you have to make when you're building lineups is am I going to be focused on lineup construction and ownership or am I going to be focused on predicting the winners? And you're going to have to do both of these things uh, regardless, because, like, well, you don't have to. You should be doing both of these things. The other option is to try and get exposure to every single outcome, uh, but it's not, it's just not worth, it's not worth it in the long run. I think, I think the best thing to do, uh, is to try to actually predict winners and then build your lineups based on, based on that information. Um, so for this video, we're going to be focused on lineup construction and ownership first. Uh, and this is, this is like the way that you would approach it. If you don't have any opinions about the teams that are playing tonight and you depend on somebody else to tell you, uh, like what is a good play, what is a good play? What is a bad play? Uh, so the best way to start, uh, using the sheet is to go to ADC, ADC captain. So like there's a different tabs for the potential ADC lineups, mid jungle, top and support. And what we're going to do is go through the different kind of captains that are available and it'll show you how you can stack them with other teams. Uh, so uh, when looking through the sheet, one, keep a lookout for teams that are close to fitting together, but don't fit this is a good chance for a pivot and a four to one uh so so let's look for one of those first okay so right now we have t1 as our primary stack and we're gonna look at the different options when we have teddy as our captain so you can't stack teddy with t1 uh because you need to get two, two, two teams in there. At least two teams. Stack number two. JDG and uh, T1. Way too expensive. So we're like 20, between 1900 to 2900 too expensive. Uh, so there will, there will be no one out there tonight with this kind of lineup construction. Team three. 
T1 plus DRX. Uh, so this is another favorite and we cannot stack this one together either. So I think you're seeing a trend. Uh, it's, it's pretty tough to stack the biggest favorite on the night with other favorites. And that's just something that you'll come to realize after working with the sheet for a decent amount of time. And uh, so, I, so I'm making this video because I, I was asked a, a question in the Twitch stream. This guy is building between 50 to 75 lineups, which is a healthy number of lineups. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think the sheet is so beneficial is because instead of having to go through and build one lineup after another, after another, after another, you can go into the sheet. You can start writing down like tonight I like uh, this captain, this team stacked with this team and then it'll show you like four different options or five different options where you can combine those two teams together uh so this this is a very big help for hand builders because there are different different spots to identify like from salary constraints so this is what i was talking about earlier if you want to stack uh teddy as your captain with vg gaming or lng which are both in the same game right so if t1 is the highest scoring team on the slate and VG Gaming or LNG is the second highest scoring team on the slate, then one of these kinds of lineups has a very high chance of winning or chopping a tournament. And uh, these are all too expensive. So you might be asking yourself, Pykel, what the hell are you talking about? These are all too expensive. I can't stack these teams together. And you're right. But if you pivot one player off of this, just one. One player. Use your brain for about four seconds. Find find one other player that you like from a team that will win. And there you go. You got a 4-2-1 that fits in the amount of salary that you're allowed to use on DraftKings.com. Uh so that this is also where this is this is why it's important to know which uh which teams that you like to win, because you need to be able to make those pivot decisions based off of this. And uh, one thing that I've said in the past is that creating a DraftKings lineup is like creating a parlay within a parlay because you're parlaying the two teams, but then you're also saying, I think that this player, this player, and this player are going to be the three highest scoring players on this, on the, on this team. And then these other two players are going to be the highest scoring on this team. So it's, it's pretty difficult. And that's why it's important to understand which kind of stacks are available because you can run that parlay like 10 times, 20 times by using the sheet. So like if you thought T1 and Vici Gaming were a smash and there was some underdog that you liked, then you would just sub out probably the team slot um, or one of these other spots to get a 4-2-1. And that would give you um, a bunch of good lineups. Uh, so in order to stack T1 tonight, you need to go down to one of the bigger underdogs. So you would need to stack T1 with a Freak of Freaks. So a Freak of Freaks would have to beat uh, DRX or Rogue Warriors would have to beat JDG. Uh, or you could game stack and the game stack I think is a pretty bad idea in general uh, on a four game slate. Okay, let me rephrase that. A game stack is not... A game stack where you do a 4-2-1 is a bad idea almost all the time unless it's a one game slate where uh, not a one game slate uh, best of ones because in a best in a slate where it's all best of ones you could have one game where it's like 25 to 20 and you need to have both of those team both of those teams to um to win a tournament but it's more likely that you're going to be on a slate where it's best of threes and the winners will on average score much more than the losers because like just that's just the way it is like I, I don't I can't really get much into much more detail than that um, so yeah be careful with game stacks uh, so basically this is pretty tough Th these are not the best the best like um, expected value lineups because you have one team that's projected to win like probably 65% of the time and the other team is projected to win 30% of the time so that's kind of tough but this is this is where the sheet comes in handy so you take a look at something like uh t1 plus vici gaming or t1 plus lng and it barely it's barely too expensive but if you do a 3-4 now you can get access to those kinds of lineups 
Uh, these are all still too expensive, but now you can get VG Gaming and you can get LNG uh, Esports into a stack without having to worry about um, the salary constraint. Now, these are more likely to be duplicated, but they're still pretty good lineups uh, for the most part. Uh, so basically, yeah, something like... Zika is pretty interesting, so maybe you do Zika, iBoy, and Hong, Vici Gaming. You have a little bit of extra money. Maybe you upgrade the team slot. Maybe you think that there's a better AD carry out there. Uh, it'd be tough to create that kind of lineup. But uh, it, it would be tough to roster Hong and not iBoy. Is that's what I'm? That's what I was trying to say. And then Zika is actually pretty low. Uh, pretty low. Has a low salary tonight. Um, but yeah, so these are the other teams. Let's go to a different team just to see what else it looks like. Cuz it's actually pretty low right there. Um, so let's go to DRX. JDG ADC. Fine, Dingo. Way to be a dingus about it. Uh, okay. Now we're on JDG ADC, and it's still very expensive. T1, very expensive. Uh, DRX, very expensive. VG Gaming is too expensive, and so is LNG. So again, you're going to have to look for a spot to pivot within here. You can probably get off of uh, Maple or Light and do like a, a one-off there. Maybe that maybe that works out pretty well. Otherwise, you have to go down to a Freak of Freaks, Rogue Warriors, or Sandbox. And that is pretty tough to convince yourself of, like I said before. Uh, so then we go to three fours. And these are all still way too, not way too expensive. These are all still too expensive, but then you get access to some of these lineups down here, right? Uh, and that's, that's basically how I use the sheet every day, uh, just to give myself an idea of like what lineups are good, which lineups are bad. Every once in a while, you'll find one that just fits and like every other combination doesn't work out. So some players who are hand building aren't going to realize, oh, well, this player is actually slightly underpriced relative to the rest of their team. So as long as I include them in my stack, I'll be able to uh, create a stack with two teams that I like a lot. And I think we'll probably find at least one of those with DRX. So this is a second thing to look out for, too. Um find stack combinations where only one of the options fits for two teams <clears throat> so these are all too expensive so let's get down to here so drx plus vg gaming works drx plus lng works um but these are very close. So this is what I was talking about. If you're somebody who builds by hand and you're not using something like this sheet, you're going to look at like one or two of the options for LNG plus, um, plus DRX. And maybe let's say this is the first one that you try and it's 100 off. And you're like, damn, I really like these two teams together, but it just doesn't fit tonight. And instead of trying all the different combinations uh, by hand in the DraftKings, like, interface you just look at the sheet and you say oh well you know these two don't work but these two actually work so i'll just run one of these ones out that's kind of how you have to do it uh i'm surprised that it's i'm surprised that it's like that so lng is like more expensive that's interesting and then with the three fours, you can get both in there. But some of them still don't work. Uh, so I think... Is that helpful? I think I think you guys should have benefited from that. Um, so let's see. 7,400. So let's, let's take a look at mid lane. And the reason, the reason why it's important to go from, like, tab to tab is to like it's you'll you'll be very surprised like if you just went to the adc tab 
you would think to yourself like, oh, you know, I can't get T1 plus DRX at all. But if you use the sheet, it's like, oh, look, Faker and Chovy actually fit in the lineup tonight. If, if these are the two highest scoring teams on the slate and everybody else is hand building, look at this kind of team right here. This is like, okay, Doran, I'm not a huge fan of Doran, but Chovy, I get access to Chovy. This is 49,900. If these are the two best teams, bam, that's a good lineup. Uh, so that's, that's really how you have to use the sheet. All right, cool. Um, all right. So that's basically, that's basically it. Just wanted to answer this video for some, answer this question for somebody on stream, but I'm going to upload it to YouTube so that everybody can kind of realize, um, uh, like how you're supposed to be using the sheet. I, there are some other things that I'll try to go over and like, I'll keep a list like this. Actually. Okay. Video is not ending right now. Video is not ending. That was a false. That was a false ending. Everyone who left, haha, -ha, bunch of suckers. But now we're going to look at the second part of this process. So the other, the other part is line of construction and ownership. And then it's also predicting winners. So I would say, when you're just using the sheet, it's like lineup construction, which lineup construction equals which teams fit together in which combinations. You're goddamn right I lied to you. Bunch of bunch of fools. In which combinations. And then ownership. I think we're gonna have to do it like this. Huh, those morons who left. Oh, they're missing out on this one. Um, so the second thing is ownership. So you can either, you can do this two ways. Either projected, well, it's always projected. Uh, either projected or assumed ownership. So I think that there are ways to kind of get an idea of how owned um, the different players are going to be. I was working on this with Dark Sheep and um, this guy Nick at one point but that kind of all fell through. But I think that uh, a good starting point for a projected ownership is by taking their money line, converting their money line to an implied win percentage. And then um, once you have all those, you can kind of get an idea for how, how often like the carries are going to be used. So if a team is 60% owned, if a team is 60% if a team is projected to win 60% of the time and it's a four game slate, then that player, every individual player should be owned at least 15%. Um, and the reason I say that as like the baseline is because you have four winners and all of those winners, in my opinion, have a, have a pretty close chance of being the highest scoring team on the slate there's a lot of variance and like you have to take a bunch of other things into consideration but that's the starting point so any any favorite that is owned under 15 percent is a good opportunity to like get ownership on them and then um obviously underdogs are going to be less expensive than that uh pick me a winner uh i'll pick you four winners so so the um the next part of this is assumed ownership. So assumed ownership, you can kind of just do it based off of, like, I know that this is going to be the most popular team because last time that they played, they scored a lot of points. And this team is going to be unknown because nobody likes the team, like Invictus Gaming, for example, or Immortals. But for very different reasons. Man, that gas was crazy. I had a bl I had an Oreo cheesecake blizzard, and the cheesecake thing in there was really weird. It was basically just chunks of cream cheese. Not not great. The blizzard, good. The chunks of cheesecake, if you can even call it cheesecake, not so good. Uh, predicting the winners. So this is this is the part that I think I focus on a lot more than other people. I want to know which four teams are going to win, and how hard are they going to win? So are they going to win 2-0? Are they going to win 2-1? Are they going to lose 1-2? Are they going to get swept? Those are the four options that really matter. Well, those are the only four options that matter for best of three. Um, so when I use the term live dog, I mean they're, they can go 2-1 or 1-2. to two. 
if if I think that an underdog has a chance to 2-0, then I'll probably make a bet on them to win the match. Uh, or I can do individual games, which is a pretty good idea as well, getting one of the first two games, or when they're blue side, depending on the team. Uh, so predicting winners. Why does predicting winners help with uh, building my lineups and using the sheet? It just gives you a good first place to start. So it's like, okay, I think that tonight T1 is going to win. I think that DRX is going to win. I think that uh, JDG is going to win, right? So if you think that those three teams are going to win, uh, and then LNG or Vici, whichever one you like better, uh, I think that these four, blue historically is a big edge. Uh, it depends on the team, though, for this kind of patch. Because the Ophelios Ezreal thing is kind of changing, uh, like drafting strategies, but in general, yes, blue is an advantage. Uh, but it is kind of a philosophical question. Would you rather have? Um, so, okay, so LS thinks that red side is an advantage because you can counterpick, but the data shows us that red side does not counterpick as much as they should, so it's not an advantage. Theoretically, I think red is an advantage. Red and blue both have different advantages. Uh, I think basically LS is... I can't tell how dogmatic he is about what he talks about. I think that it's borderline dogmatic. Uh, as a starting point, I think saying, like, if you're a team who drafts well, then red side should be an advantage for you. Like, that seems like a much more well-reasoned way to say that. Uh, LS is really smart, though. Some teams do really good on red side, so it's probably more individual. Yeah, but we have to look at the reasons why they're good at red side. Teams that are good at red side drafting are good at counter-picking enemy champions. Yeah, he is pretty dogmatic, yeah. Uh, and I try not to be... I. I, I really, really try not to be. Dogma is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> I, that might actually be dogmatic. But um, function of champion pools, not really. All these players have big champion pools. Uh, almost all these, all, almost all of these players have big champion pools, but your champion pool needs to include a counter pick for, uh, the champ for their champion and current number of broke. Yeah, the number the thing is League of Legends at its at its core is a game of rock paper scissor. You play rock paper scissor like 5 times during champion select and then you figure out which team has more advantages and then they have to play they have to play that out on the map, which is it's fun. It's a that's a fun way to that's a fun kind of game. Like and you can win from a losing position and stuff like that so it is interesting for that reason as well like it's not decided in, in champ select like a hundred percent of the time but you can create big advantages in champ select uh the thing is okay this is actually a pretty good point uh just to speak to what note just asked so he asked in the chat um basically like during the pick ban phase blue side or red side has an advantage based on champion pools and the current number of broken champions that's the working theory that we're we're working off of uh so i would say that from a game system perspective if there are a lot if there are a lot of broken champions then red side should have an advantage if there are a few broken champions, then blue side should have the advantage because they're more likely to get the broken champion. However, if the quote-unquote broken champion is difficult to blind pick because they're easily countered, then you have a problem uh, from a pick ban perspective. So let's take the Aphelios example. Aphelios on blue side, probably the, probably the most important champion. I, I don't know if I'd say the most broken champion. Probably the most broken champion. But it's like the pick ban phase revolves around that first pick. So Aphelios, very important first pick overall. A lot of people consider him to be broken. Uh, and 
I think part of the reason why he's thought of as being broken is because teams aren't act like aren't pick banning around him correctly. So if you know Aphelios' weaknesses, then you should be getting as many of those into your team comp as possible. That's really what you need to do. And that's pretty obvious, but that's what you have to do. The difference of opinion that I have is I think that most champions aren't extremely broken. Or they're at, they're at least they're not broken to the point where they can't be countered. I just think that a lot of teams right now, there are a lot of teams out there that don't they don't want to think for themselves. And this is not a League of Legends specific problem. There are just a lot of people out there who don't want to think for themselves. They want somebody like LS to tell them this is how you this is the best uh this is the best champion in League of Legends. This is the best way to build a champion. This is uh the best team composition for pro play. They just want to be spoon fed like this is the best thing. And that's why I'm using the phrase dogma because or the term dogma. Because that's exactly what it is. It's a it's a stultif it's like stultified, that's a word, right? Uh it's an it's a dead concept. It's like there's no uh, there's nothing that changes about it. Um, yeah, there was, uh, yeah, the way that I look at it and the way that I try to be anti-dogmatic is, um, there was a quote by Milton, I think, where he talks about truth is like a, uh, a streaming fountain. If it doesn't flow uh, perpetually, then its waters will sicken into a muddied pool of conformity and tradition or something like that. And basically he was talking about like religious, uh, religious doctrines and religious people who were dogmatic and didn't like critically think about what they were consuming. And then, uh, just like bastardized the original concept. Yeah. So it happens in every part of life. This isn't a this isn't a video game problem. This is a human being problem. Uh yeah. So that's enough for that. Uh Um so we went on a little bit of a tangent there, but for lineup building, like I said, you you need to figure out am I focused on lineup construction, ownership or predicting winners? You need to do all three of these things, but this is you need to pick one of those as your starting point. And then a few tips for looking through the sheet. Keep a lookout for teams that are close to fitting together but don't fit because you can 4-2-1 or pivot off of it. It can also help you find out which which uh, players are going to be under-owned. And if you can find the first instance of a team fitting together with another team, that will probably go over-owned. So like if you can't do an ADC captain or a mid-captain with a team but you can do a jungle captain, the jungler is probably going to be a little over-owned. And that combination is going to be over on like the four, three with a jungler as a captain, man, that cheesecake, che Oreo cheesecake blizzard making me feel some type of way right now. Uh, and then when looking through the sheet, yeah, look for those. And then two, find stack combinations where only one of the options fits for two teams because that has a chance of going overlooked. Uh, but now I'm going to end this video. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this video, like, comment, subscribe, share it on Twitter, share it on Reddit, blah, blah, blah. I'll see you tomorrow.